and welcome back to another episode of Wise Words Book Signs. Today, Jess, we're going to be talking about The Art of Explanation by Ross Atkins. Um, now, Ross Atkins is an English journalist, right, um, and an analysis editor for the BBC. He presents Outside Source, um, which is kind of like, how would you just explain it, Jess? It's kind of like just explainer videos. On it is explainer topics. videos, I think, based upon the, the most recent topics in the world, I believe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so he has to kind of formulate his videos in a particular way so that he can explain it in the most succinct, simple, and all these other ways that we'll get onto. Um, I think we kind of just, how did we come across this book? Was it just on, uh, just in the I want to say it was a classic Amazon algorithm. Yeah. You know, the sort of yeah. classic, this book is probably, you know, right for you. Uh, yeah. we, we, we had already decided between the two of us, as we talked on our end of year or beginning of year podcast, that we wanted to go into communication. And I mean, the art of explanation, the name in itself sort of spoke to us and we we're like, okay, yes, that's something as, as what we try and do on this channel is explaining the ideas from the books. We thought what better book could there be than the art of explanation? Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. So uh, it was kind of the first time that I think I heard of him, actually. And I'm not sure whether I've actually seen any of his uh, kind of explainer outside source videos. Um, so yeah, I should probably actually check them out after this. Uh, yeah. But yeah, no, it was it was it was a good book. Um, it was really nice and simple to, to follow. Um, had a pretty good layout. Uh, I mean, you would hope so, considering it's called The Art of Explanation. So um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and yeah, so and I think we're going to implement a lot of this kind of to our book summaries and the way that we podcast. Um, yeah. yeah, it's something we're looking to build into sort of the way we present our ideas, including the way we script up our podcasts, etc. Um, I mean, some of some of the some of the stuff we're going to talk about today is pretty simple. It's, it's a lot of re refining what you're trying to say, reducing and removing all the words that aren't necessary and try and make things as easy to understand as simple as possible, which is actually mm -hmm. funny enough one of the most reoccurring themes I could think of across all the different communication books we've read, including, you know, stuff like made to stick, etc. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so should we, should we jump into it? Yeah. So just before, do we, should we just do the key topics that people are going to sort of like look, take yeah, away yeah, from this yeah, book? We got the 10 attributes that make up a good explanation. We got five helpful, helpful questions to get you to know your audience, as well as Ross Atkins favorite, like famous seven step explanation framework. <laughs> yeah. Which he uses not only for um, for his sort of TV show, but he also recommends using a, a simpler seven step for dynamic explanations, which he kind of, his way of describing it is sort of explaining stuff on the fly, um, which I thought was also quite useful. And he had an interesting bit at the end where you're going to learn about how to send uh, good emails, because yeah. that's something that I think a lot of people struggle to do or suffer from the inability to just make emails, you know, one or two lines rather than paragraphs. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I got, I could definitely use that. To be fair, I, I use a bit of chat GPT now and then to write emails. When, yeah, I, like, when I really have to think, um, I try and outsource it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, cool. All right, well, um, let's, let's dive into the intro then. So to explain something effectively is not just about mastering the details. It's about organizing and simplifying complex ideas in a way that makes sense to others. Um, a good explanation should grab attention by being clear, focused, and directly relevant to the listener. Explaining is, is kind of a two-way street. I mean, as the explainer, you aim to share information and sometimes encourage action, right? Your explanation has to be so good that it kind of invites people's attention. Um, meanwhile, the listener wants the explanation to be clear and useful. So poor explanations take more time to understand and can fail to convey the message properly. Um, it's important to gather the right information, but equally, uh, crucial is how you present it. And we'll touch on this a lot, but considering its relevance and how easy it is for your audience to grasp effective explanations. Um, yeah. So this careful mix can sig uh, significantly enhance understanding. And when all these elements work together, your message comes across loud and clear, which is ideally what you want at the end of the day. <laughs> yes. So now it's time to discover the power of explanation. Ross Atkins has developed a method to collect, analyze, and use a lot, a lot of information effectively for explaining ideas and building arguments. The centrality of explanations. Effective explainers captivate by addressing knowledge gaps, providing the essential background. 
Ross Atkins embarked on this style of explanation after recognising that superior information on phones possesses a challenge to tr traditional news consumption. Viewers, he discovered, turn on the television not for breaking news, but for detailed context, live visuals, curation and analysis. And it is kind of true, like, uh, you yeah. know, most people do get the news now from their phone sort of thing. And I, I feel like, I don't know about you, but me personally, if I saw some breaking news on the BBC or, or, or some sort of app that comes off my phone, I immediately kind of go to these news outlets on TV, for example, to try and verify maybe that what I read was true, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's kind it must be pretty daunting, like when they were in that transition of how people are now using like Twitter or X um, and all these other kind of like social media platforms because they're closer to the source, right? Like normally it would be like a journalist and no one else would be able to take videos or the videos would have to be uploaded so they'd, so they'd be sent to like a news outlet. Whereas now it's like you can just type in the event that's occurring on X and you're right at the source. But it only shows like a clip of it. And I think he touches on this in the book where, you know, you know that a bomb has gone off, but now you want the extra details, you want the context. Yeah, and all those the things statistics, the data, the sort of, the stuff yeah. that makes it a bit more real as well, right? There, I mean, there's a difference here, which he's saying, which is kind of like, you know, you read you read the text, maybe you see what you write, like a small video, but when you sort of turn on and switch on to see the news, you probably see multiple sources, multiple different videos, more context, more understanding of why it came about, right? And you don't kind of get that from that first person X um, tweet or, or whatever it's called now. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So yeah, it must be, must be strange, but you can understand how his reasoning behind you know, having to be good at explanations has come about because he's had to adapt to the climate of, you know, okay, well, now we need to change up our layout of how we present information. And it's got to explain things in a really succinct way, way for people to understand really easily, you know? Um, yeah, and I guess another thing is the, the environment in terms of um, the distractions are everywhere now. So if people, you know, aren't glued or sorry, aren't attracted to the way you're explaining something within the first, you know, couple of seconds, and if they just see like, this is a low, um, this is not good information. I don't understand this. I'm confused. They're highly likely just to switch off and go on their phones or whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah. So why is it important to be good at explaining things? Well, explanation is relevant, whatever you're making the case for. Uh, regardless of the subject, a well-crafted explanation not only enhances promotion, but also elevates the essence of what's advocated, increasing the chances of a favourable outcome. So this is literally just applicable to everyone. Whenever we're trying to get across a point, I mean, you want to be able to do it in the most simplified and easy way to understand. So, um, I mean, yeah, if you can kind of ingrain these and make them natural and in, like really embedded in just how you explain things in general, I think you're going to benefit so much from it. Yeah, well, if you think about it, it's also relevant to sort of persuasion, right? Like if you can't clearly explain like a situation to somebody, then how are they ever going to take your side on, on, a, on a, you know, maybe like a, on a conflict, for example, or if you're trying to convince somebody to take or understand like your new idea, new business idea, the only way to make them be able to sort of back it is by explaining it in a way that they will understand and actually feel sort of motivated to want to support, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can see how this kind of ties in with a lot of confidence as well. If you know what you're explaining and people are able to understand it, they'll see you as confident with that idea, with that thought, with that explanation, um, which just gives a lot of like kind of, you know, reputation to you, essentially. Yes. Um, yeah. So a great way to improve your explanation ability is learn from others who excel in communication. So watch them and really observe what they're doing. And I think this is something that both of us have kind of started to stumble across and do more and more. Like, you know, we'll find someone who we really like respect and we think they're great at communicating and be like, oh, he does that really well. She does that really well. I want to take that. I want to take this. Um, and I think that's a really good way. You kind of learn from observation, like have those kind of role models in your head. Um, if you think a lot, that's a lot of how we sort of learn as a kid, isn't it really? You sort of imitate and mimic the people you look up to, to some degree. And, th and there's a reason why these people, if you if you sort of admire their communication ability, there is something there that's making you admire it. So it's just trying to watch them enough and try and figure out what exactly it is and how potentially you can incorporate the style, the words, whatever it is, into your into your own personal arsenal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, great. All right. Well, so it's all great um, to pick up tips from other good explainers, but before we dive in, let's chat about what actually makes a good explanation. 
Um, and that sets the stage for our next section, um, part one, the anatomy of a good explanation. So the 10 attributes that make up a good explanation. Number one is simplicity. Number two, essential detail. Three is complexity. Four is efficiency. Five is precision. A lot of these do sound very similar, but there are yeah. differentials <laughs> between them. Six, context. Seven, no distractions. Eight, engaging. Nine, useful. And 10, clarity of purpose. So let's now dive into them in more detail. So first of all, we have simplicity. Effective communication hinges on simplicity. Short words and concise sentences remove obstacles to comprehension. So watch out for hindrances like words, facts, or phrases that act as barriers. Eliminate superf superfluous ad adjectives, <laughs> <laughs> obscure vocabulary, <laughs> unnecessary details, and late fee sentences. The aim is clear communication through the removal of distractions. So ask yourself this, is this the simplest way I can say this? Yeah. And then we're on to essential detail. So you should want to simplify the language, um, but uh, not the subject matter, right? Which, and those are two very different things. Detail is valuable, so choose it wisely. Too much and it can dilute the essential information. A surplus of non-essential details diminishes impact and hinders effective communication. It kind of dilutes what you're trying to explain at the end of the day. Um, I had this quote here, including most of the interesting detail on the subject can be seductive, but beware the law of diminishing returns. Every piece of non-essential information makes it harder for the essential information to be communicated. And God, I wish I had read that when I was at uni. I would just try and incorporate so much ridiculous stuff that probably wasn't needed. Um, but yeah, so it's worth asking yourself, what detail is essential to this explanation? Yes. So then number three, complexity. Navigating complexities in communication is vital. Naturally, the more complicated the subject, the greater the risk to an effective explanation. You need to be confident in describing something with clarity and fluency. If you find yourself avoiding complexity, it usually is a clue that you are not ready to explain it yet. Rather than jumping the gun, it is better to take your time to understand the content before attempting to explain it. So understanding the complexity around a topic matters for two reasons. The first, if complexity is badly explained, then it can undermine not only what someone's understanding, sorry, it can undermine not only someone's understanding of what you're trying to convey, but also their faith in you as a source of useful information. And number two, by gaining a better understanding of a particular topic, you can step back and make better judgments about what to include in your explanation, which is, is so true, isn't it? It's like when you yeah, get to so next true. levels of expertise around a, top, like a topic, right? You know what's important, what's not. It's like when you go to the doctors, they know what signs they're looking for to figure out a diagnosis, right? Rather than taking it all into like, what do you have mm -hmm. for breakfast? Doesn't yeah. bloody matter. Did you throw up? Yes. Okay. You know, it's that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty yeah, self yeah. in that context, but you get, you get what I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so yes, to finish off this point, ask yourself, are there elements of this subject that I don't understand? Mm, absolutely. It's such an important point. And I think, you know, when you just try to uh, explain something without fully understanding it, you get tripped up as you're explaining it, right? Mm. You know, we, I think we've all been there when we're trying to explain a point and then as we're explaining it, we're like, fuck, actually, I don't know this. I don't know what mm. I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so then on to efficiency. So an example of working within the confines of a boundary and being efficient. So presenting, uh, this was like an example that I really liked. I loved it as well, yeah. I've been using it a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's such a good one. He was talking about Steve Jobs and he was saying, presenting the first iPod prototype, engineers faced rejection from Steve Jobs, who found it too big. Despite the engineers' insistence that it couldn't be made any smaller, Jobs proceeded to walk over to a fish tank and drop it in. And then from which air bubbles arose. And he said, you see those air bubbles? That means there's space. So make it smaller. And I love that. I love the, just the, I, I wish I was there to watch it. I wish I was just a fly on the wall watching it because that would have been cool. Um, but this idea, this concept can also be applied to explanations. So in, uh, instead of tightening up explanations, we tend to fall into three traps, rushing delivery, cramming too much information or discarding valuable details all of which can harm our explanation. Instead, we want to find those details, those gaps, and really tighten them up so it's really succinct and purposeful and straight to the, straight to the point. Um, so ask yourself, is this the most succinct way I can say this? Yes. And I think, are we at number five now? I think it's number five. I think so. Yes. 
I'm going to say it anyway. Five. Yeah. Precision. <laughs> <laughs> Effective writing hinges on selecting the precise words to convey your intended meaning. Choosing words may seem straightforward, but a common mistake is failing to express exactly what we mean. The process of getting it right involves first figuring out what we want to convey. In the words of Alan Little, if your sentences are too long, your writing hasn't been disciplined enough. If your writing hasn't been disciplined enough, your thinking hasn't been disciplined enough. Discipline is key to clarity. So if the content is potent enough, the words can be sparse. In an explanation, less becomes more when the core information is valuable. Remember, emotional writing wields its power when it's punishingly precise. So mm. with this all being said, ask yourself, am I saying exactly what I want to communicate? Yeah, I think there's a lot of merit in that. And there was an example that um, he had in the book of like Joni Mitchell and one of her like albums, I think. Um, she's a singer. And um, they were just saying that it was like, it was so perfect that they didn't need to tweak anything, right? Like it was kind of very simple, but because the words or the music in, or the melody in this case was so on point that they didn't need to add anything. And the same thing can kind of be applied to words. Like when you, when you, choose your word uh, your words so carefully and they're like so precise to what you want to explain then you don't need all this like peripheral stuff all this superfluous um uh all these superfluous words that most of the time just try to convince ourselves that we know it and that we're trying to explain it, you know yeah um yeah okay so context so in explanation context is crucial nothing in human exist uh, experience exists in isolation Significance comes from connections to other events, people, or knowledge. Recognizable phrases like, the reason this matters is, stress the importance of maintaining context. By providing context, you enhance understanding and increase the chances of engaging your audience. So ask yourself, why does this matter to the people I'm addressing? And this makes so much sense, right? Like, we want you to be able to relate to it. Whoever you're talking to, you want to be able to, like, gauge it from their perspective and it's like what what additional information can i give them that gives this context so that they can understand yeah. it so that they can relate to it otherwise it's just an abstract concept right it's almost kind of like asking the question yeah like like it says it why does it matter to the people like you're trying to link it back to how it could affect somebody maybe you know yeah. it's kind of like i guess maybe something that's happening in another country right like a war for example you could be like mm. linking it back going well the reason why you should care about this is because of the supply chain issue that's going to be caused by it or by some other thing which is like the threat of a, of, of a world war right that type of thing yeah no absolutely and i think you know this probably ties into the next section that we'll get onto but the idea of like knowing your audience because yeah. if you know who you're talking to then you can present your idea within a context that actually like makes sense to them you know yeah. Um, you know, someone who's does a corporate job is going to be very different to someone who does a creative job. And so you might want to tailor it and put like a context in for your concept where it makes more sense for them. Um, yeah, I mean, well, that's, that's the, exactly the reason why I guess you have all these different, um, news journals. I mean, not even just like mainstream news. I'm talking here, like business related stuff, like yeah. you know, financial times, business insider, they're all trying to curate news based upon the audience, right? Like that is yeah. technically what they do. Um, and obviously packaging up the information in a way that's like, this is why you should care because you're, you're interested in finance. Well, this is interesting for you type of thing, you know, yeah, yeah. whereas the, yeah. the, the, the mainstream financial use uh, news, sorry, usually revolves around, I guess, pricing of, uh, common things. Whereas in comparison, if you go to like a specialist finance journal, yeah, you're getting stock, stock tips, et cetera. Right. Yeah. 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 No, so cool. Number seven, then we're on to no distractions. Um, Explanations often falter due to distractions, which manifest in both verbal and visual forms. So what are ver verbal distractions and how can we avoid them? One form of verbal distractions can be the words we use. Speakers often introduce unfamiliar words or references, assuming shared knowledge. This can leave listeners confused or disengaged. And this is a classic example of um, the sort of curse of knowledge, isn't yeah. it? With, uh, from the made to stick and just, you know, when you know what you're talking about and you're using all these words related to the topic that you're talking about, like if you start rattling off like specific economic terms, you know, most people don't actually know the terms mm. or they might, have, they might have seen them some other places, but they never know the exact definition. Right. For example. And then you think you're, you're communicating, but they're like, the f what is this guy on about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so then, yeah, failing to explain something may seem tempting, but it risks alienating the audience. Therefore it is crucial to assess the listener's level of knowledge. When a reference arises, especially to a partially known or unknown concept, Strategic explanations or deletions become necessary. 
An easy way to get around this is to separate words into two categories, partially known and unknown. Partially known words such as inflation or Paris Climate Accord may require explanations, whilst unknown words like proroguing demand <laughs> careful consideration. Well, I don't even know what that is. Yeah. Um, so resist using complex vocabulary solely for the sake of appearing clever. Clear communication trumps linguistic flair as it ensure your audience engagement and comprehension. It, and it makes we'll, it makes yeah. a lot of sense, doesn't it? You've had it where like you're in a conversation and someone uses some really big fucking fancy word. And instead of like listening to them after that point, you're there thinking, fuck, what is proroguing? What is that yeah. word? You know? Um, yeah, it's funny. So yeah, that's it, it, it's true. And like you said, it's, it, it's also worth thinking as well about if I am going to explain what this word even means, is it even worth the time to do that? Or can I just find a replacement for that word? Can I just mm. find a way of explaining that in a way that makes sense? Yeah. Uh, or a more casual way, I guess, of referencing it. Um, so yeah, and then what are visual distractions and how can we avoid them? In the visual realm, distractions arise when images lack relevance or purpose. Instead of using visuals as a mere backdrop, integrate them purposefully, referencing them explicitly. They need to enhance rather than detract from the narrative. Only showcase visuals when explicitly referenced. So uh, to avoid cluttering the explanation. So yeah. avoid providing multiple competing information sources. Cluttering with visuals or references can interfere with comprehension. A singular, well-referenced source ensures clarity and engagement. So with all this being said, ask yourself, are there verbal, written, or visual distractions? Yeah. No, I think it's really good. And it's something that you kind of don't really think about that much. Like when you started saying oh, verbal or visual distractions, it, you're like, oh, what the fuck is he talking about? But actually, I mean, it kind of makes sense. I've even kind of got one that you probably, most people see in day-to-day -day life kind of when somebody references somebody's name that you've never met mm. i think that's exactly the same concept when somebody's like, oh yeah this guy tim my, my friend tim you yeah like, the story's great but i don't because i can't picture the person and i don't know the person mm -hmm. i really struggle to pay attention or, or remember the story better whereas if it's somebody you've actually met a couple of times before it just seems to stick a lot yeah. better but you're, when people just start referencing people's names if you know who they are i'm a bit like i have <laughs> i don't know what you're talking about who's this guy yeah. You know? It's quite funny, actually, because you, you see that a lot when you're in like groups of people, yes. you know, when like one other person might know who Tim is, but you don't. And so this person's talking about Tim, but really the, the, the best thing would be to be like, oh, yeah, so Tim is someone that we both know. And he's yes. uh, and they're giving, you, like, giving you a little bit of a backstory, almost exactly. like, a, you know, exactly. Tim, that guy, he's like an absolute, he's a meathead. Yeah, yeah. You know, or something, like, something which gives you a bit of, like, once again, giving you context yeah. To, yeah. to sort of like latch all this information you're about to hear on. Whereas if it's just like you said, a, a random name, Tim, who with no backdrop or understanding of his like story or who he is, you just be yeah. like, oh, yeah. who's Tim? Like, and I guess, I guess all, like, the rest of them all like, oh, classic Tim behaving yeah. like that again. You're like, well, who's Tim? Yeah. I guess we're also guilty of that to some extent when we talk about books or authors sometimes, because you yes. might just be like, oh, you know, uh, the myth of mental illness or like David Sars and like, who the fuck yeah, are yeah. these? Well, but the, do you know what? On, we've now just caught ourselves out on this yeah. on this uh, podcast yeah. because I, I I agree with that. But then is is it necessary for the explanation of the book? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe yeah. I should have said the, earlier on about Made to Stick, one of the best books I've ever read on communication by Chip and Dan Heath, which I would recommend everybody read. Look into the camera now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So moving on to the next section. So engaging. You need to constantly check for attention lapses and ask yourself, is my plan clear and purposeful? Am I giving reasons to stay engaged? Was it too wordy? Did this section serve a clear purpose? Was the information essential or just interesting? Were we inadvertently giving reasons for people's attention to wander? The best explanations seamlessly connect each section part by part. But if one link underperforms, it can impact the entire chain. Um, so you want to ask yourself, are there moments when attention could waver? Yes. And I, th I believe he goes into more detail in the future about how you can mm. connect these, these parts of your explanation up to make it more engaging. Yeah. So we got to number nine now, useful. So Ross explains that whenever he sets out to explain something, he creates a list of anticipated questions. Answering them all increases the likelihood that the audience will be interested in what I have to say and not be distracted by dwelling on questions. And it does kind of make sense, like, if you can almost like FAQ it before you're even creating or giving the explanation, or the most common questions you receive, it's a bit like when you debate, right? When you have a bunch of points, you're trying to mm. figure out the counterpoint, so you already have an answer for it. It's kind of like that, um, except for you're, you're trying to figure out what is it that people are going to 
start thinking about when you're going through your speech and then can you answer them in advance? Yeah. So yeah, to, to finish off, ask yourself, have I answered the question that people have? I think it's really important. It also helps you try and think from different perspectives about your concept that you're trying to explain. So you get a, a, a wider understanding of what you're actually trying to explain. Um, and I think that's quite important. And then this, this one is number 10, I do know this. Clarity of purpose. If you're not sure exactly what you're trying to do or say, people tend to notice. In reviewing any communication, a powerful test is to ask if each element explicitly supports the overall purpose. Removing irrelevant parts leaves a purpose-aligned a purpose aligned collection. The purpose guides every decision in preparing an explanation. So you wanna ask yourself, above all else, what am I trying to explain? And I think that is something really, really important, because if you always keep in mind what the purpose is of your explanation, then every decision along the way of, of creating that explanation, you can link back to be like, OK, what's my purpose here? Am I am I actually still staying aligned? It's your compass, essentially. It's interesting um, that you put it number 10, you know, because um, hmm. I just read yeah. a book on online writing by I think it's Nicholas Cole, and he he almost advocates for the the inverse, the sort of you start with your purpose. You you mm. need to refine everything from the get go through the idea of what am I actually trying to say in this explanation text or whatever. Yeah, and it's a very good point actually. I wonder whether this is supposed to be in order because he didn't explicitly. No, I don't think it is. I think you're right. I think you just you almost said like this is the anatomy of a good explanation. Yeah. Like this is the step by step approach to creating a good explanation that's mm -hmm. actually technically the seven steps which is coming up soon yeah. right to sum up the 10 attributes of a good explanation number one simplicity is this the simplest way that you can say it number two essential detail what detail is essential to this explanation number three is complexity are there elements of the subject that you don't understand number four is efficiency is this the most succinct way that you could say this number five is precision are you saying it exactly uh, the way you want to communicate Number six is context. Why does this matter to the people that you're addressing? And number seven, no distractions. Are there verbal, written, or visual distractions? Number eight, engaging. Are there moments when attention could waver? Number nine, is it useful? Have I answered the questions that people have? And number 10, the last and most important, clarity of purpose. Above all else, what are you trying to explain? And I guess also what's the context of the explanation as well, right? Yeah, I guess so. You know, if it's different if you're trying to explain a topic to some kids v's you know trying to convince your boss for a salary raise you know yeah, yeah. to remember no, exactly well i guess that's that leads us on to the next point doesn't it which yeah. is know your audience know who your audience is so you see the more we know about who we are speaking to the more you can calibrate your explanation and the more likely you are to communicate effectively so to do this we can ask five helpful questions Number one is the target. Who am I actually talking to? Like you said, am I talking to a child or am I talking to a really old person? You know, um, exactly. um, number two, knowledge assessment on this subject. What do they know and what would they like to know? While we can't know everyone's knowledge entirely, we can assess their understanding. As the audience grows, it becomes more challenging, but striving to understand their needs helps tailor the most relevant and beneficial information. And then we have number three, which is tailor it. So now you want to tailor that information. So ask yourself, how do they like to receive information? You may have the right message, but you risk your audience's attention if you deliver it in the wrong way. Then there is number four. So you want to make it personal. How best can you convey that this information is for them? So I think there was a quote here that I had. So most of the time we are constantly competing for people's attention. One of the most effective ways of getting that attention is to make your intended audience realize that what you have is for them. If someone feels you are talking to them, they are far more likely to engage and respond. Equally, if someone feels you are communicating with a group, but not particularly with them, they pay less attention and are less likely to respond. I mean, it just um, makes sense, doesn't it? It's it like, does. Oi, Tris, you're gonna like, we're gonna look, turn yeah. around and look, right? <laughs> but like, it, it's it's the same premise, but like for like a larger group. So, for example, with a lot of our advertising we do for Slidify, it literally the first line is attention rugby clubs. Yeah, you know, attention rugby players, attention football players, because then you know I'm direct, and you're like, oh, I'm a football player, so yeah. you know, they need to get my attention or whatever. It's it just exactly. does make sense, right? Yeah.
It really does because it's also it also taps into those like things that you relate to that are part of your identity that you can also capitalize on. So like um, there's an example here. So use the information you know about your audience, like where they are listening, age, etc., to direct your question at them. For example, if you're listening in Australia, how are you affected by rising temperatures, right? So then all the Australians suddenly like pick up and they're like, oh, I yeah. am listening in in Australia. So it kind of makes sense. You're like, you know, you're stimulating their attention. Um, and then last, number five, believing in the messenger. How best can you be credible? Now, being mindful of the foundation of your credibility and selecting the right language significantly improves your chances of being heard. Of course, we can't always possess credibility in advance, especially when addressing those unfamiliar with us or individuals who believe they have more knowledge on the topic. But you can build credibility into your explanation by asking yourself three questions. Am I credible to the people I'm addressing? So that's like, how do I want to be seen and am I achieving this? And then who do I need to be credible to? So can they be uh, treated as one or are there different groups for each group? Are there long term way of building my credibility? Um, and if yes, then what form would that take? And if no, how can I build my credibility quickly? And then lastly, the last question is, which aspects of my experience and knowledge will enhance my credibility? So can I speak on these areas with fluency and precision? And those is kind of like, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, you're not always going to be an expert at what you're talking about, but there are other elements that give you credibility. If you know quite a lot about what you're talking about, even if you aren't an expert, um, then yeah, it lends to people being like, okay, actually fair enough. Like, oh, I can listen to that. I can hear that out. Yeah. There's some interesting, like, it's an interesting parallel I'm going to draw here with the book I just finished about um, online writing. Mm. He, he talked about a different type of credibility, credibility, sorry, that I'd never really heard of before. And he called it like earned credibility. And it's where you've done, it might not be like a title, something like, oh, I am the BBC producer. Yeah. But it's something like credibility proof that you, you know the topic. So you could say something along the lines of, I've been studying psychology part time for five years. Yeah. And it's quite interesting, just you could, I, I know it's kind of not particularly too relevant to this, but it was just interesting, the idea that credibility can also come from time spent, days spent doing stuff. So you can let people know your credibility through through that. Be like, I've written online for three years in a row, like literally every day, and using that as a credibility signal. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is just, yeah. It was a little, it just reminded me of that when we were talking about credibility. No, it's quite so, cool. I like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's one that he was a bit like, let's just say you're somebody who, um, maybe doesn't have the credibility in the sense of uh, you have a PhD or you work for like a really good, like a really big company or whatever, and you're trying to create a blog or something where you want people to listen to your opinions. So instead of being like, um, well, you don't really have like a bio to put like, oh, this is me featured five times on Forbes. You don't yeah, have that yeah, bio. Yeah, yeah. You can put in the earned credibility if you've done it. So for example, we could do something on the lines of podcasting for three years. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Asking three years, you know, that type of thing. And it's, it's credibility that you can't really fake. Yeah. No, because as, as long as you can show that you've done it, right. And that you've actually experienced it. Cause I guess at the end of the day, yes. Okay. We create all these titles and you yeah. can have a signed piece of paper that says you've got a degree in this or degree in that. But at the end of the day, it's essentially just experience and whether you've done well in it. And you can yeah. show that by being like, look, we've read this many books on this topic. We've also created, you know, a big business off the back of it or, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But it kind of shows that you have been active. And I mean, another example we could personally do would be we have 150 book summaries on our website in the sense that you don't just do that overnight. That's earned credibility. Yeah, exactly. You've not just done it once, twice, three times. You've done it 150 times. So it's like, well, there's proof that we've done the thing we say we're going to do. It's not like, oh, we summarize books and oh, we've got three on our website. It's like, okay, yeah. no, you've actually got a lot. And I just thought it was a really interesting concept because a lot of people don't, or well, they're too scared to promote the actions they've taken. It could be something on the lines of, listen to me about the gym because I've been going for three years straight. Yeah. yeah. That type of thing is it's, it's more compelling than somebody who's just like, oh yeah, I just, I studied, I studied, uh, you know, uh, nutrition or whatever. Yeah. Like, of course that, that counts as credible. I'm not saying it doesn't. I'm just saying there's other forms of credibility, which if anything are potentially even more credible when you spend every day or five days a week going to the gym or whatever for three years, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I so yeah. <laughs> anyway, now we've talked about what a great explanation consists of and how to go about knowing your audience, uh, who your audience is. Now we need to explore the approach to constructing a great explanation. So now we're moving on to uh, part three, which is the seven step explanation. 
and we're going to start with step one, which is the setup. So before crafting your explanation, contemplate these questions to help shape it. Number one, what do you hope to explain and or communicate? Provide one sentence maximum. If you're, if you're struggling with that, write a paragraph with everything you think is the purpose of this explanation. Read it over a couple of times. How would you summarize this overall purpose? Number two, who is this explanation for? Number three, is there a consistency of knowledge amongst those you're addressing? And to be fair, a lot of these points are just sort of addressing all the stuff we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. It's kind people. of like putting it into the order now. Exactly. No, you know, you're right. Exactly that. It's turning it into the step-by-step -step order that you should be thinking about these things. So um, number four, how do you assess their knowledge of this subject? Number five, how would you summarize what they'd like to learn from you? Number six, what specific questions will this explanation need to answer? And number seven, what, if anything, do we know about how they like to receive the information? So once again, are, where are they, where are they, um, are, are they reading this? Are they watching mm -hmm. this, etc. Eight, are there ways you could find out more? Nine, where will this be consumed? I think that's pretty much the same as before, but I guess it's more, yeah. less about the, um, sorry, wh where they're watching is in like a phone, but more like yeah, the actual yeah, yeah. right? So number 10, is there a fixed duration? And 11, is the duration strict? So a quick check at the end of this point is, are you happy with what you're doing? and who it is for. So obviously, once again, this is all about answering the most important questions of the explanation, which is you can't miss this step because if you miss this step, <laughs> yeah. how the hell do you know where you're going? <laughs> yes, exactly. You want that guide. You want it, the compass to be pointing you in the right direction. Um, okay, and then on to step two. So find the information. So in this step, the goal is not to organize the information, but rather gather all potentially relevant details in one spot. Start by asking yourself, where and how should I look for information? And two, which parts of the subject do I want to explain? So where to find trustworthy and reliable information? So Ross points out a great rule of thumb here, and that is, uh, that's often used in the BBC, which is the two source rule, which refers to seeking information from two reliable sources. However, you know, naturally determining what counts as reliable is slightly subjective. Um, but you want to be asking, what's the source? Um, so is, is a swift method to gauge information and quality. If no source is found, it's a reason for skepticism. And when a source is identified, the next step is assessing its reliability. So similar to news, um, news sources, the reliability of information from different friends varies. Um, one may have a proven track record while another may be less reliable. Um, realistically. And so it kind of makes a lot of sense to have these kind of two sources. So you come back up or, um, you know, I was even thinking it's such like a high value top, like a question to ask yourself, regardless of even if you're explaining something, you know, you see something on the internet, it's like, what's the source? Yeah. Oh, some random dude who's got an anonymous account. Okay. That sounds, that sounds pretty, you know, trustworthy. I quite, I quite like the, I quite like the phrase. It kind of sounds like quite colloquial. Like what's the source mate? What's the source? Yeah, yeah give us yeah. the source. <laughs> yeah, um, I quite like that. And I, oh, I, I remember making a note while I was reading it. I'd be like, I should start saying this to mates. You know, when your mates like say something that sounds like, oh, did you know this, right? Yeah. We, I was at a table the other day and someone was saying that the reason why, I overheard this conversation, but the reason why cyclists shave their legs is not to do with streamline. It's because they're going so fast that their hairs can catch on fire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was with this other person and we were at the other end of the table and we overheard this. And I was like, I have to fact check this. I have to do it because this is like either would blow my mind or just, you know, um, make me feel good about myself. Uh, um, but we put out fires. Sorry. I thought wind. Was <laughs> yeah, clearly not in this case. No, but um, I think that's like a kind of prime example of like you know you overhear these rumors or people will tell you stuff and it's, and it's like, so exceptional and like yeah. like you, it's like uh, what's the word controversial I guess it's, mm. it just flips it on his head. You're right. You just like you said you've remembered this right. Yeah. Like most other things you don't like you wouldn't even think about the other conversations too much. But this one yeah, like yeah. do I go, am I going to catch on fire? <laughs> Yeah, you start running and then it's like sprinting and you're like Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> oh god but um yeah so that makes a lot of sense to have that and then making you know checking whether it's reliable so now you want to move on to your question list so anticipate confusion identify potential areas of misunderstanding in your explanations embrace the question what don't you understand to avoid self-deception and ensure genuine comprehension 
Remind yourself that merely possessing accurate information does not guarantee understanding. And that's such a good point. I mean, there's been so many times where like, you know, I'll go like when I was writing essays at uni, you know, like you would read some textbooks, you'd find some gold, but you don't actually understand it. And just because you have it there doesn't mean that you you suddenly understand the actual content. You need to be able to- And the implications. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So the quick check is at this stage, you should have um, a brief overview of your topic and audience, anticipated audience questions, areas where you seek better understanding, key subject areas to cover, and a gathered reservoir of information. So now uh, uh, that we've acquired all that information, we want to move on to step three, where we distill the information. Yes, so step three, distill the information. The aim of this distillation is to refine our information to its core, the most concise and usable form. We strive for clarity by eliminating anything non-essential to understanding these elements. So in the first sweep or the first review, you want to reconnect with your purpose, initiate an assessment of your information, question the relevance as you read. For each retained section, pinpoint its unique value by asking yourself, what is it that is of value here? And then eliminate any excess. And as you navigate through the information, distill a list of valuable elements, facts, phrases, arguments, quotes, statistics, graphics, and theories stripped down to their simplest, most impactful forms for your explanation. Then we're going to go for a second sweep because the first one wasn't enough. No, it's not. <laughs> so we're going to go back to the beginning and we're going to start again. Delete <laughs> anything that is not relevant or does not align for your purpose. Be decisive. If it doesn't contribute to your goal, remove it. One of the things I, I did like, and I do we have it here? No. He talked a lot about if you're somebody, because I'm somebody who's quite like this, um, that you feel anxious for deleting the information. Mm. He said, open up a separate document where you put all the deleted elements into it. Because I don't know about you, I'm somebody who goes, oh my God, I still might need this at some point. I still might need this. I don't want to completely destroy it and forget about it. So he recommends having like a, a cut out document next to it. Like I see yeah. a scrap one where you put all the deleted phrases so you can technically reference it later. But he even oh, said he does this and he like never references it. Like he never even goes back and checks. Yeah. But it's just there for like that sort of psychological peace of mind. Yeah, sake of mind. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, I can't, I, oh, I didn't remember him saying that about like, um, you know, phrases. Because he definitely talks about that, about um, information that you're not sure whether you're going to need or not, which we'll get okay. onto in a bit. But um, yeah, that's a good point because I do that. I, I told us, maybe he did have that nuance in the book, but I took it as very much mm. like if you're deleting anything at this point, if you if you feel anxious about deleting it, there's probably a reason for it. And if it's going to cause you that much pain, just put it in like a, a maybe pile or like a, you know, a potential reinstatement pile. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. So, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And now on that exact note, so if you don't know how to decide if something is relevant or not, try asking yourself these questions. So does this element align with the overarching purpose of the explanation? Once again, all about the purpose. Yes or no? No. Gone. So what significance does the particular element hold in the explanation? If uncertain, keep it for now. The priority is removing information that doesn't help. So mastering the art of separating essential from non-essential enhances clarity in explanations and communications. And it's one of these things that, oh God, there is a quote and I'm going to absolutely butcher it where it's something like, I only had two minutes, so I wrote you a long explanation. Instead of oh, short. yeah. You knew yeah. the one I'm on about? Yeah. yeah. I, I can't remember who said it, but anyway. But it's the letter, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the whole, the, exactly. I wrote you a long letter in two minutes. If I, you know, if I had more time, I'd have, write, have written you a short one. Yeah. And it kind of just reminds me of that. And I mean, even in this step, for example, he's making you go through twice, you know? Mm-hmm. How often do people go through their what their work twice and refine it? Not very often, right? But I still find it funny because the the um the incentives at university, right, to some degree, is like you have to write a two thousand word essay. And obviously, some people overstate it and then like, yeah. cut back. But I guarantee you, most essays can be cut by almost like fifty percent if oh you've got all the yeah. shit in it. You yeah. know, um, yeah, I I yeah I I always struggled, and then they're like, you've got to cut this down more, and I'm like, but I can't. I like <laughs> this sentence. I like the way it sounds, and that's precisely it. You have this kind of emotional attachment to it and you just got to be able to rip the band it's, it's, it's an emotional attachment to a brain fart and you just <laughs> exactly you really like the smell of it and you just <laughs> oh man <damn> it. so <laughs> yeah. sorry quick check <laughs> this is the summarizing of the chapter so are there any gaps in the information you need if there are repeat steps two and three for where you see a gap and number three do you have anything to add to the list of questions you already have and four is all the information you have in its simplest form so now that we've distilled all our information 
It's time to meticulously organize it, which is exactly what we do. We will be doing, sorry, in step four. Yeah. So in this step, we delve into identifying what Ross terms as strands of an explanation or what others might refer to as sections, chunks or uh, themes. So, for example, a 10 minute presentation, you might have five strands, whereas for 30 minute presentation, you might have five to 10, something like that. It's kind of just, the, you know, I would normally think about it like themes, probably. Um, but or maybe even main points. Yeah. That's kind topics. of how I was thinking of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. So what story do you want to tell? So once you've identified your strands, we're going to add two more. One for uncertain information and one for high impact details suitable for the beginning and the end of the explanation. So that one for uncertain information, that's the one that I was kind of referencing just before. Yeah. Um, so stories are crucial in explanations as their central message brings coherence, connection, and emotion to all you offer. Information, um, that's to information, design, products, customer service. I mean, all those things, like when you present it in a theme of a story, it just becomes so much more coherent, engaging, because that's just how we think. That's how we think about things. Um, so before and after writing, ask yourself, what's this story in five words? Ensure you've captured that essence. So while facts and context are valuable, stories just surpass them in capturing attention and curiosity. The best explanations weave relevant information into well-told narratives. So you wanna to pause to ponder the story you aim to tell. Consider exercises like describing your work when someone calls or experimenting with various starting points. You'll quickly discern the most effective ones. And there's loads of different story structures. Jess, do you want to? Yeah, I'll go for it. So there are diverse storytelling approaches for explanations. So if you're seeking inspiration, consider these cl classic methods. So number one, you've got chronological, and this is pretty standard. It's structuring your story based on the passage of time. So breaking into sections that highlight the key developments as they unfold. Number two is the finish start finish. So you begin by outlining the desired outcome, then revisit the start, working through to how it happened, looping back to the outcome, which you, you've seen some films of that, haven't you? Where they sort yeah. of end with somebody's, you know, being killed and then it goes back two days in the yeah, past yeah. and explains the, the reason why, right? Um, so number three, we've got zoom out. So start with a focused event or issue, gradually expanding to reveal more context and detail. Arguably, you could use that to be like, look at this really small thing that's happened in the world, mm -hmm. but zooming out, look how much impact it's going to have on the rest of the world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, number four is all context. So in the all context approach, you unravel an issue systematically. After introducing the main point, you assert, yet comprehending this requires delving into X. So introduce and conclude each strand, building the intricate context step by step, um, which I would, I would assume, to be honest, depending upon the explanation, that's probably one of the best yeah uh, would be if it yeah. depends on how if you're really going to go into this or storytelling mode or if you're actually just trying to explain maybe something more i don't know biological or something which yes which yeah. lacks the sort of narrative behind it unless you want to weave one in yeah um, so number five what someone said build your explanation around a powerful statement or finding start with this using it as a reference point throughout for a cohesive structure and language number six is solving a problem so identify a problem then outline step by step how it was addressed it's quite a good one as well, mm. um, especially we've talked a lot about this before and, um, you know, how science is taught where we kind of taught explanations and not really like what was the problem this scientist was trying to, uh, like you know, solve. And then if you, you start piecing together the theories by the problems, it gives you way more context to how somebody came up with, mm -hmm. I don't know, DNA, let's just say, or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. absolutely. Whereas you just learn that it exists, right? And you learn who did it. You don't learn what problem were they trying to find and how were they trying to find it? Um, well, nearly all like innovations stem from like a problem being solved or question being yeah. asked and then yeah, that answer exactly being that, found, yeah. right? So it's like, you can understand why it's at the crux of a lot of stories because it's like, this is how it started. You know, this was why someone asked, this is why Einstein asked this question, you know? Yeah, um, you know, exactly that. This is what was known up until that point. Mm. This is the problem he was trying to solve. This is the experiment and look at what he was trying to find with that experiment. Like, look at the way it's structured. How was, why was he doing it this way? And it's like, okay, he was trying to figure out this. And then he discovered this. It kind of just wakes way more sense than just, you know, the classic get up in the front of the board, E equals MC squared, learn it, yeah. you know, yeah, give yeah, you some yeah. mass and stuff. Let's, let's just do it. <laughs> um, and then seven, we got block by block. So by constructing your explanation in front of the audience, you can build momentum and curiosity as you state that each part of the explanation would not make sense without the part that has gone before. 
Yeah. Um, and that's similar to the other one, to be honest, which was the all context one, but yeah. Yeah. So those are pretty handy. I think, um, I kind of want to implement them, uh, when I do. Yeah. I was saying to you, build, build it into like a notion database or something like I'm explaining something here. Here's the seven sort of beginning options. Which one do you want? And then, yeah. Like, like, and I reckon you have like, you know, you could quickly, like we just went through all of those. If you have a concept in your head, be like, okay, which one does this kind of fit the best? Mm. You know, well, that's um, what that's in my head, the value of having this type of like these type of frameworks available to you. Cause it's just yeah. like, I have already the idea that I want to explain which one suits it best. Um, and you've got, I'm sure there's maybe one or two that work better than others. Um, but it's just worth having that in front. It's the classic sort of case of, um, starting with a blank page or starting with words already there when the words are already there you, you feel more inspiration at least i do yeah. it's the yeah. hardest thing ever is to start writing on on, a, on an empty canvas yeah no i completely agree absolutely so then you want to add the information so once you've got that story so then you want to organize your distilled information by placing each element into the appropriate st uh, strand of your story and since your choice of strands is guided by the distillation process, most elements will naturally find a place. If something seems out of place but remains important, allocate it to that strand that we were talking about earlier on. That's for uncertain information. Additionally, be on the lookout for elements with exceptional clarity, relevance and impact. Consider placing them in the strand that we were also talking about earlier on, the high impact details suitable for the beginning and the end. Um, the specific order of elements within each strand is not crucial at this stage. You just need to be able to, you know, assign your, your information into each strand, essentially. Um, cool. So now moving on to the next step, we're going to organize the information within the strands. So now let's delve into each subject strand individually, review all the elements within it and ponder these questions. So number one is what do I aim to accomplish with each strand of the explanation? Number two, among the elements in each strand, which are the most crucial? Three, what should be the starting point for each strand? Four, which elements naturally flow from one to another? And lastly, in this moment, how would you articulate each strand to someone? And I thought this point was quite interesting. and He does mm. touch on it later, which is he likes the idea of sometimes just pretending you're trying to explain something to somebody else through speech yeah. because he yeah. thinks it's the best way to get it to be more conversational. Um, so how would you go about talking about this one strand to somebody with the bullet points you've got there? Can you say it out loud? And then maybe that's the best way to structure it. Mm. Because usually when we try and structure our speech, we kind of organize it in a way that actually makes logical sense. Or you like to think so. We don't yeah, always yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, because that's why you have to be able to understand it very well. Because once you do, you have more flexibility to say it in a way that is a lot more um, precise and seamless. Yeah. Because otherwise, it it reflects whether you know the content well enough, uh, well enough or not. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, so arrange elements within each strand to create a logical order. Start with the key element, introduce subsequent pieces, and build a cohesive narrative. Ensure each element serves its purpose, continuing until the strand effectively conveys the intended information. Identify any missing elements, and if needed, fill those gaps to complete the narrative. Cool. And I remember this. He had a little bit about this, the high-impact element. So create an impactful introduction and conclusion by selecting elements that fit these roles. Place them together in new strands marked, ensuring alignment with your chosen narrative structure. Note, the chosen element should align with the narrative structure you've chosen overall. Mm. Um, and I remember he, he didn't really have any real good advice on actually how to create these high impact elements. He kind of talked about sourcing from other authors or other materials and yeah. you almost give the classic sort of like divine inspiration. Um, he kind of knows it when he gets it because to be fair, it's a lot easier to say like a very vague thing is to actually give a practical guide on how to create, you know, some awesome statement. Um, but basically here, I guess he's just trying to say, if you think something's a very concise, strong way of saying something, make sure you put that either at the beginning or the end or mark it as that's a really strong phrase that I need to use to maybe reinforce one of my points. Yeah. It's kind of funny because you can see how that plays out in certain like podcasts and things like that, right? At the beginning, they do the trailer, right? They've got all the like nuggets, all the kind of hooks right at the yeah. beginning so that you're kind of peaked. And then at the end of the like, you know, whether it's a short video or whatever, you know, they finish on the high note, you know, they, they, they finish like, this is the call to action. This is what you should do kind of thing. Um, yeah. You can see how it kind of ties in quite well. 
Okay, and then the next step is on visual elements. So you can enhance clarity and impact with visual elements by incorporating them into each strand. Start by one, identifying key phrases, facts, or actions to emphasize. Then two, determine the visual content for the beginning of your explanation. And three, plan a concluding image that will leave a lasting impression. And once again, this makes sense. It's just to enhance what you're already saying, but finding, you know, it, like you said earlier, like we were talking about earlier on, they need to be, um, they need to give value. They can't just be there for the sake of it, you know, um, they're there to enhance what you're already talking about. So then a quick check is from this section, you should have clarity on your explanations, purpose, narrative, and storytelling approach. Assess the effectiveness of your strands and determine if visual elements are needed. Identify any new areas for, co uh, for coverage and evaluate the not sure strand. Consider seeking advice if necessary. Cool. So now we've organized all the information into their appropriate strands. Now it's time to move on to step five and start writing this explanation up. So step five is linking the information. So before putting pen to paper, consider these questions. And he, my God, this guy loves a question. He so really he does. does. He really does. But I think there's more questions in this than a more beautiful question, the book by Warren Berger. Yeah, <laughs> it's true, isn't it? But like, the more I think about it, the more I see how useful questions are they to obviously like guide your thinking, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm going to follow a checklist, but because checklists are so broad and they can't be specified for everybody, they might as well ask you a question which reminds you of what you should personally do in that situation. Mm. That makes sense. He can't give you a checklist without questions in a way, if that makes sense, because he, he's got to ask you a question to, for you to think about it in your specific context of yeah. how you're going to answer it, right? Um, so yeah, anyway, yeah, more questions. It, just, on, just on that point, I think it's really good because I think questions are literally just actionable thoughts, yes. right? It's like, yeah. you know, if, if there isn't an actionable thing that you can actually do and you're talking about something abstract then you just reframe it into like I mean, a question. I guess we could even like the examples I'm about to say now, we could even turn it into more of a statement. So the, the question number one is, is your language as straightforward as possible? It could just be make language straightforward as possible. Yeah. But there's something about when you say is you, you actually consider it. Mm. Whereas when it's like a statement, it's kind of like make it, it doesn't for me, at least my brain doesn't work the same way when I hear make it as simple as possible. Yeah. When it goes is, I then start looking for uh, for disconfirmatory evidence or like, oh my god, that probably isn't that straightforward. Yeah, if that makes yeah. sense. There is, I, I don't know, know how to explain it. There is a difference. Yeah, and with the the when you include like your right your yes. language, it makes it personable. Yeah, and then you start to consider your language rather than just language yeah. in general. So well, I, think I wonder it, if it is. I wonder if you're right, but that way about that about the the personal part, like adding the personal pronoun. So like, is do you understand the purpose of each element instead of like. Hmm. Uh, or like instead of being a sentence of make sure you understand the purpose of each element do you understand it's kind of like you said it's more personal but you actually take it i was gonna say take it to heart it's not quite like that but it's but it taps into your like, ownership of it doesn't it yeah it does yeah because if you could say is language as straightforward but then that's a kind of different question altogether right but when you say is your language i think it just you start to reflect on it gives your... you like you said it makes you responsible kind of for it, it to some yes, degree. yeah yeah responsibility i think is that so Anyway, off that little sidebar, we'll start again from number one. So is your language as straightforward as possible? Number two, do you understand the purpose of each element? Number three, are you crystal clear about the message of each sentence? Four, identify, oh, here we go, we've got statements. Identify any remaining areas of uncertainty. Five, mm -hmm. make a note of lingering questions. Six, ensure you have your list of anticipated audience questions ready. I mean, you could turn those into questions, couldn't yeah, you? Yeah, you could, yeah. Do, uh, me. Do, you have, yeah. do you have a note of lingering questions? Question yeah. Mark. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so then let the writing begin. Start at the beginning, shaping the narrative by starting each section with the elements you've placed at the top. If you face challenges in the flow, try starting with a different element. If stuck, ident identify whether it's due to uncertainty about what to say or how to express it. Addressing these questions usually resolves blocks. There may also be practical, um, a practical problem. So consider discarding or adding elements or adjusting the order which might contribute to challenges. And that makes sense. It's like, you know, just as you're getting ready, make sure it kind of all fits and it all flows like kind of nicely and that it actually makes sense um, so that you don't have to go back later on once you've started writing all of this down. Um, yes. Yeah. So, right, we're now on to some, and this is quite a long part because there's a lot of different techniques. So, mm. 
writing techniques to help you explain and tell your story. So number one, or the, one of the first main points was avoiding hard stops. So incorporate sentences seamlessly to maintain the flow and prevent hard stops or breaks. Consider using trailing techniques, which involves providing a hint or preview of what's coming up next, encouraging listeners or viewers to stay tuned. Then he's got surfacing the structure. So expi explicitly state the structure of your explanation to provide a roadmap for your audience. And this kind of reminds me a bit of like the seven, you know, the seven steps of explanation kind of yeah. thing. It's like, yeah. it's making you know the structure in advance. You know, there's going to be seven steps, right? Yeah. So this not only helps structure your thoughts, but also helps your audience see the subject from the same vantage point as you. So use phrases like, now we have looked at this, the next part of this is this. And to be honest, it's quite funny because I don't know if people who've been listening, we've been trying to use yeah. these type of phrases between our steps, which we wouldn't have normally done in the past. So we're yeah. you know, trying to put it into, into practice, uh, practice. So all explanations have a start and a destination. Most are linear and linear communication is easy to follow. However, on some subjects, being linear is not always possible. You may need to go at a tangent to provide necessary background or context. So if you're going to go on a tangent, signal it with phrases like, now I mentioned this, but we can't go any further without examining this. Oh, sorry, we can't go any further without examining how this fits into what I was previously saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah I see yeah. the X's and Y's. I thought I was doing algebra again. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Mr. Then, Dave would be proud. Yeah, he would be proud of me. <laughs> then, then the one we've been using a lot in this is the joining phrases. So experimenting with joining phrases and hooks to maintain continuous momentum and smooth transitions between elements. Mm -hmm. So incorporate micro trails that look back and look forward, connecting elements seamlessly. For example, that fact helps us understand this issue, but it's not the full picture. To get that, you also need to factor in this. Um, yeah. And and then this is the one I didn't get too well on my own personal. Yeah, I was a bit you, you explained it a bit better in this one. So back announcements or back annos, he calls them. Mm -hmm. But the way I kind of understood these is more like, going back and referencing something you said earlier on in your conversation. That's kind of how I understood it. It was like, yeah. I'm going to announce a statistic at the beginning, like this many people died. And then later on, I'm going to re-reference -re that statistic and give it more context. Yeah. I think it's kind of how I, um, yeah, I think it, it's, it links a lot to the kind of one of the stories, you know, the story methods where it's like, you're kind yeah. of go back to then go forward. Um, yeah. and it's like just to reference something that might be important to then what you're about to go and talk about. Um, ah yes and re-referencing it because it's important for the next yeah. point kind of thing so like i guess if you started with a statistic like this many this many people were impacted because of an event you then go off and make a point and then before you go to the next point you need to re-reference the statistic again because you want to make a another point right exactly yeah, yeah. you want to bring that with you into the next point so yeah um yeah so that so that's yeah that's a back a back announcement or back anno i think he calls it Hmm. Um, and then we have parallel chronologies. So explore the use of parallel strands in your explanation to create a powerful storytelling effect. Use words like meanwhile and as to switch between different events occurring simultaneously. For example, as crisis was happening in one place, something was happening in another. Yeah. Um, which is, I mean, that's pretty much used all the time in the news, let's be honest. Like, oh, yeah. this was happening over here, then you never know over here this was going on. Um, and then these are, this next one is a pretty standard. Uh, technique, I guess, splitting sentences into two. So opting for shorter sentences, especially in verbal explanations to enhance comprehension and delivery. Follow the rule of thumb of not exceeding 15 words in a sentence for better clarity. And um, the book I just read on online writing was um, talking a lot about this and also about varying sentence length, which I thought was super interesting mm. about almost like creating like a, a musical composition where you, you speed up in certain areas and you slow down in other areas. And I thought I never, I have never really contemplated um, that element of good writing, but I feel like you know it when you see it. Well, I think you also naturally do it sometimes when you're telling stories, right? Yes. Like you're yeah. getting to a climax and you're like, you know, you might be like amped up. And then as soon as like something impactful happens, you, you know, you suddenly, and then the guy walks into the room, you know, and it, you change yeah. the pace and you change the like volume based on the content that you're talking about, um, the words you're using. Yeah, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yes. And, it, and also another point he was making as well, which was like short sentences, obviously build up sort of maybe like tension, you could say, or the speed. Mm -hmm. But he was also saying using short sentences with rep, repetitions. So like repeating the thing you said like a couple of times, but in different contexts. It's yeah. so like the lights went off, it went black, blah, blah, blah. You just, you kind of build more from the small sentences that builds yeah. like a crescendo is what he like sort of um, used as an analogy for it. Yeah, um, that makes sense. But yeah, just to finish off the last two then, so we got put the subject or the sentence near the front. 
So start your sentence with the subject for clarity and focus, avoiding placement in the middle to prevent confusion. Ref this, reference, sorry, the subject before you talk about it, which kind of does make sense. Yeah. Otherwise, he gave a few examples of it. And I, I remember reading it thinking, yeah, that's a good point. Like when you read it, you kind of get the context a bit better, mm. but when you speak it out loud, it doesn't make sense to have the subject so far into the into the well, sentence. Well, he's kind of priming you. So then all the following words, right? You're mm. then linking to that main subject at the very beginning of the sentence. Um, which I think yeah. can probably help with understanding a lot, right? Rather well, sure, than like, but... you've got all these words and you're trying to think about how they all connect and then suddenly yeah. it gives you something. And then it suddenly gives you what it connects to, whereas at the beginning it's like the cyclist. Okay, we yeah. now know what the subject is. What's going to happen to the cyclist? It kind exactly. Of, and bring it there later. probably are scenarios where that is applicable because you could imagine like you're building suspense by not talking about the subject and then you tie it all together at the last minute. But I reckon that's more appropriate for different scenarios. Um, yeah. For sure. Not when you want to explain something and you need no, that subject to be no, you know, exactly. specifically mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. And fine, the last technique he, he mentioned was the power of and. So leverage the word and at the start of a sentence or as a joining phrase to signal to your audience, that's not all. And I, I was telling you the other day, I saw a lot of people, or when I've been trying to watch people who I respect, doing podcasts a lot of the time they kind of either buying themselves some time or when they finish one of their points they would kind of do like a long and because you know they're then going on to say something else rather yeah, yeah. than you know we, i mean we're pretty guilty of doing stuff where we go more like um kind yeah. of thing where they would be like and because because yeah. when we're saying um we're almost trying to add on to the phrase anyway so you might as well just say and but yeah. you know it's so yeah. difficult to get yourself out of that, that exactly. habit there's also the times where we're like yeah 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 so on to the yeah. next point. <laughs> I just did it anyway. <laughs> Although coming in with an and isn't quite the same, is it? Like yeah. and it's just like me taking over. Yeah, exactly. And, and shut up. Let me go. <laughs> Too funny. Um, <laughs> and then on to the next part. Yeah. Does this sound like me? So understand your communication style and preferences. Consider what you'd say and what you wouldn't, letting this awareness guide your expression. And I think that's quite important because also like I'm very, I'm very guilty of that. Isn't I write how I speak, which I like, but also, you know, if I try you know, at uni, I had to write in a particular way and I actually hated it because it didn't allow me to get any across anything across of me and how I would explain things. If you get what I mean. Yes. Um, and I think especially verbally when you're having a conversation, you want to explain something. It doesn't sound natural if you just try to, you know, read something or like you know you've rehearsed the script it's got to it's got to sound like you the melody's got to match you and how people you know hear you I, I wonder if there's a tone difference you have when you speak more freely than if you're scripted and stuff and i guess, I, I, guess yeah. I guess the best actors to some degree try and get themselves out of that don't they that's almost like they try and de-script themselves so that it comes out as if they're just that's what they're thinking well that's one of the things that he talks about later on that we'll get on to but the idea of like you learn something until it's perfect and then you keep going until it sounds natural. Um, yeah, okay. And that's what, like, if I try to learn my lines for a script or something, I try and learn it inside and out so that then I can almost just say it as if I'm having a conversation. Um, I guess this is why these, some actors end up impersonating or bringing in the, the personality of somebody they're trying to pretend to be because they literally bring in the phrases, the mannerisms, the ideas to try and become them. You know, it's like, exactly. yeah. 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 So then bring things together. So as you conclude, instead of simply stating in conclusion, signal that it's a result of the preceding information. Here are some examples. So considering all of that, or taking all of that, uh, taking all of these factors into account, or reaching the cumulative point, the idea here is that you're just, you know, you're referencing everything. You're bringing it all into this crescendo, into this conclusion, rather than just being like, so now, you know, we finished. Um, so I think that's quite an important point. And then last point here, the beginning and the end. Your first and last sentences are key for engaging your audience and leaving a lasting impression. Crafting compelling openers and closes helps outline your explanation's purpose and conclusion effectively. And I think that's, it's so true. I mean, I'm thinking about essays, but you could think about anything, whether it's a conversation or a podcast or a short clip or whatever, anything that like, you know, straight away, you want to be engaging someone's attention, um, activating their attention and making them like really like, you know, um, tune in. So you want to have something that really grasps them. Um, 
And it's the, the importance of the headline. It's just the importance of having like a great strong opening sentence or headline because people need to know immediately like what's in it for me. Why should I be interested? Um, exactly. And that's what that's what a great first sentence does. It kind of like picks out the audience, gives them a sort of promise, or tells them what they're going to learn, or gives them a reason for why they should care. Like you're going to die today if you play football. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, somebody help me yeah i guess that's why hooks kind of come have come about right because they're supposed yeah, yeah. to be engaging off the back um and yeah. obviously off the back of tv off the back of this we will be doing some books which revolve around discussing maybe like headlines i mean i told you about a book called hit point we can both yeah. maybe sit down and discuss some of the stuff from that because it goes into detail of like how to create these um i guess they, they're kind of clickbaity but it can be less clickbaity as mm. It can be as clickbaity as you bloody want it to be, basically, is the crux of it. Yeah. But they do have like a sort of formula for how you should like sort of create a opening introductory statement or headline because there are certain uh, structures of it that just work better than others. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, yeah, cool. We'll get onto that one at, at some point then. Okay, and then last bit. So quick check. Are you happy that you've stuck to your story structure? Have you used different techniques to provide emphasis and momentum? And does it sound like you? So now you've written up your explanation, but let's be honest, it's not there quite yet. Um, you still need to refine it and add those finishing touches. So that takes us to step six, which is Titan. Yes. So we often lean towards things we've invested in. A phenomenon, a phenomenon. Oh my God, I can't even say that. <laughs> a phenomenon, a phenomenon. Yeah. A phenomenon known as the sunk cost fallacy. But in constructing explanations, being able to detach is particularly valuable. If the only resistance is based on the time invested or personal attachment to a particular phrase, it gets cut. So here are some ways which aren't actually in questions this time to tighten your explanation. <laughs> so number one, identify essential personal place, names, dates, and statistics. Trim non-essential information for clarity. So if it's if it's not essential, delete. Just get rid of it. Two or put it in the document a lot of, that you have. We think a lot of this, uh, just to like pause a little bit. It's a lot of this is just editing. It's just yeah. like reviewing, 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 reviewing until you literally you just have five words left. Yeah. It's like I can't. I give up. Yeah. Now, and now I do something else. I don't know. Uh, and then I don't know. Like it, it is literally just one big editing sort of session you know you yeah, when be, i was like, reading this I, I was just thinking jordan peterson's like essay you know structure that he like <laughs> you know advised well, like yeah yeah it's very similar um but it, i mean like the, realistically it, it does work i mean the whole point right is you're getting to this point where everything has been deleted that's like you said unessential um and that you're just left with the absolute bare bones so um so yeah sorry detour number two streamline and simplify complex sections Three is trim unnecessary words and phrases without losing meaning. So for example, the before phrase is that's smaller compared to the other one after that's smaller than the other one. So you've deleted what of, although sorry, the word to um, the other as well. No, yeah. I've obviously deleted to the or something like that. Anyway, it's de deleting those one or two super superfluous words. I mean, yeah. we talked about this as similar with like essay writing at uni. You could probably delete all these ofs, ands, there, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, so four, eliminate anything that is unexplained and could distract. Five, make sure what you're showing matches what you're saying. Number six, craft a compelling intro and conclusive ending. Seven, make sure to answer all potential audience questions. Oh, sorry, make sure, yeah. So make sure to answer, sorry, all potential audience questions. Number eight, essential elements. Evaluate whether all the strands and elements are necessary again. Nine is second opinion. So verify accuracy, fairness, and comprehensiveness. Ensure no assumption of excessive prior knowledge and use a second perspective to assess story coherence. Hmm. Um, so that's I think that last important. one is actually really important is the idea of getting someone else's perspective on it because well, you only yeah. know what you know. Exactly. And it it taps into like right. a curse of knowledge type of thing, right? Yeah, for sure. Especially as you, if you've done all these steps right, you've basically gone through this subject, familiarized yourself with the complexity, boiled it down to what you can understand or, or your, sorry, your best understanding of it. And just because you've got a good understanding of it and you get it, doesn't mean your understanding is clear to other people, right? Yeah. I'm sure, you know, the complexities or maybe like Einstein's thoughts on certain things would never be able to be translated into somebody else's brain. And obviously he, he tries and stuff, 
Like people do try to distill the ideas down to their very crux, but even then it's still pretty difficult or it can be difficult, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, at this stage, we've got another quick check. So are you satisfied you've tightened this as far as it can go? And is there anyone you'd like to show it to? So having gathered, distilled, organized, structured, and refined multiple times, the final step is the delivery. Yes. So how can we ensure our explanations are engaging, avoiding a rushed or overwhelmed feel? We must keep in mind that perfection is not what the audience desires. Instead, they seek an explanation that captivates, one they be will and they willingly revisit. And I think that's quite important. It's like, you know, the audience aren't expecting perfection. In fact, you know, they're just, they're wondering what you're actually going to say. It's, and because they don't know what you're going to say, they can't have an idea of what, at what perfect would be. Um, so I think, yeah, you need to throw that out of your head and be like, there's no such thing as perfect in some sense. Um, but the approach to delivery is a two-step process and one is to get it to perfection or what you think is perfect, um, at, which can be achieved from step one to six, as we've been speaking about. And then two is transcend perfection to achieve a natural, almost improvised quality. And that's what I was talking about before. It's like, once you know all this stuff inside and out, and you can come at it from any angle, then you can really start to play around with it and get match it to your style you whether that's it, whether you're speaking it or writing it or anything like that but it's just like you know you can like i know this now i know it inside and out um okay so verbalization ask yourself would i speak like this if the answer is no adjustments are necessary verbalizing every explanation whether written or spoken is key begin by reading slowly ensuring each word resonates consider these three questions does this capture my voice? Adjust words for authenticity. Um, do sentences flow logically? So tweak endings or beginnings for smooth transitions. And three, does the overall flow feel right? So identify words disrupting the rhythm and refine. And repeat this process until your explanations align seamlessly with your voice and style. And I think that's, I think that's very important to do. Yeah. It's definitely worth going over and reading it before, isn't it? And making sure it comes out in the way you think mm. it comes out. Yeah. So yeah, we can, yeah, the next part then is also deciding what to do with your visual elements if you're using any. So mark your script with visual cues, aligning them with relevant sections. Some visuals complement longer sections while others are moment specific. Precise timing enhances visual impact significantly. So align the visuals with your speech rhythm for maximum effectiveness. Ensure coherence between your words and visuals by practicing with the script. Adjust the visuals until they seem seamlessly support your narrative. Re refine until they complement each other seamlessly. Remember, compelling content trumps flashy effects. Avoid unnecessary sounds or animations unless they contribute directly to your explanation. Which I think we're all kind of guilty for with like. GIFs it reminds me of doing like PowerPoints when you're like, you know, when yeah. you were at school. Yeah, the fucking like, the scribbles. Yeah. Like the... <laughs> all the all the content would be like absolutely yeah. rubbish, but you'd have all of it like coming in seamlessly and like. Yeah. <laughs> such a cut. Oh, such a, yeah. God. Funny. Just gives to show what we're all like. Eh? We're just you know, yeah. easy to be pleased. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. So script v bullet points. So a script. Maintaining focus on a script can be tricky as a lot of words will greet your eyes. You need to be able to find your place easily. And to streamline this, confirm the, fonts, um, confirm the font size for quick glances, optimize line spacing, and include headers for easy navigation. Now, while a scripted approach works on occasions, relying solely on it may hinder connection. Bullet points offer a more accessible alternative. Um, however, reading from a script risks uh, being overly formal and constraining your ability to connect with the people you're addressing. So kind of exactly what you were just saying, like, well, I wonder whether reading a script actually changes the way you come across or the tone. I think it does massively. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're constantly distracted, aren't you? It's like, you know, rather than engaging and thinking while you're like talking to someone, you're focused on the script. Um, and it's, I guess it's, I guess it's also because your your attention your your eyes are stuck on the script and therefore you can't behave in a way that's more natural you know yes when yeah. you speak without having to be fixed with your eyes you kind of I guess you feel more free hmm. I don't know how to explain it you know because when you're sort of fixed or fixated on something is in I just I feel like you feel more robotic right because you're so like locked into yeah. to the, yeah. the the teleprompter or whatever it is you're doing from 
Well, also think about it, like you're reading, right? Yeah. And reading is a cognitive like task and it's probably taking up bandwidth rather than being able Massively, to like- Massively, mate. Yeah. Massively. Like imagine- I, I, your attention. You're like, you're having to focus your attention on the, on the text, which mm-hmm. I think takes a lot of mental effort. And you're also, uh, when, when you're not on a script and you're actually talking to someone, you're in tune with them. So you can see how they're responding, how they're reacting, whether their face is changing, whether they're, whether they're shifting. And so you can, you can naturally change what you're trying to say to match them. Whereas if you're just looking at a script and then you're looking up and you're thinking, you're trying to memorize and present it, then it just, I think you become detached a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So bullet points then. So ask yourself, if your notes are just there to make you feel better or actually be better. And I think there's quite a big difference between that. We can like give ourselves just confidence just for the sake of it, but actually it's not helping our explanation. So for bullet points, create a new version of your full explanation, then go section by section, stripping out unnecessary details. Focus on trigger words that jog your memory for each segment. Practice each section individually, gradually um, stitching them together. Pay attention to natural moments to glance at your notes during practice. That's a good point about the natural natural timings. I guess when you just finished a phrase, you can like look around and then just go whoop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, on to the next part, which is specifically around uh, sort of using slides. So visual prompts. Slides can act as a visual prompt, replacing the need for notes, but practice talking through the slides until you can discuss the content naturally without relying on them. I mean, mate, I used to get so pissed off when I when I was at uni and I used to see, right, professors walk up, right, getting the paid the big bucks, all that student loan going into theirs. They walk up and they sort of turn around and read off a fucking PowerPoint. I'm like, mate, <laughs> you could have just sent that to me. I wouldn't have to pay you nine grand a year. And you're just, I just, I hate, I couldn't stand it. I was like, you yeah. haven't even had the balls or the, or the time to learn the stuff you're trying to teach me. And you, I could just stand up there and talk exactly the same way you're doing about that PowerPoint. Yeah. So for God damn yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's a bit. <laughs> I think there's also something to be said for like, from the audience perspective, it looks like they're not really connected and they don't care. Yeah, they don't, they don't care, do they? They're, there's right. no passion. They're just like, yeah, oh, this, this says this, look at this graph. Yeah. Big increase. Like, it's just. It's not the same when somebody's like really, like, it's kind of why, you know, when you watch like Jordan Peterson's maps and meaning like lectures, you can see he's like, he has, he has like obviously his PowerPoint, but I mean, he looks at it for two seconds and he's just off. He's doing his bloody yeah, hand yeah. things and all that sort of crap. But he, he just looks like he's passionate and cares about it. You know? mm. there's, there's a massive difference. And I guess almost the visuals are for the audience and not for you. And I think a lot yeah. of the time you can be convinced as, as though the, visual elements are for you to help you explain it but really i think if you understand it and you know it so well you don't really need them you just need it so that the audience can grasp Ooh. it right i've just realized why it is i think it's because obviously the people who teach it don't actually write the books if they wrote the books and the material yeah maybe. they would know it so well to communicate it but because they're just giving it to like basically script to, re- to read out the script that's kind of what it is yeah the professor is just a script reader yeah to some degree, obviously they have a detailed knowledge. They read around, they have read around the subject, right? Yeah. But if you haven't written and produced knowledge on the subject, you, you probably don't know it as well as somebody who has created like the syllabus. Mm-hmm. And therefore, if you're not a co-creator of the syllabus, you're highly likely just to be reading out the abstract points of which they probably don't have time to, you know, sit there and speak no. it out days before they're not paid enough to care either. Yeah. No, yeah. Exactly. yeah professors, script, script readers. Fantastic. Yeah. I remember having loads of professors who were like, well, lecturers who were mm. just like lecturing something that they didn't really know much about. Exactly. Like, like this isn't really, I mean, it's exactly the same thing, mate. But yeah. you think about it, it's the same for schools to some degree as well. Like when you're teaching anybody it's why the teachers used to get so fucked off. If you said why too many times, yeah. why, why, why eventually like fuck it. It's on the syllabus. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. That's why you need to pass your exam. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Anyway. So next part is pace. Something I really struggle with. So speaking slower, not only enhances engagement, but also improves breathing, which can convey authority. To assess your performance, record and listen to yourself or seek feedback like we've done recently. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's true. I, I sometimes when I'm you know, speaking, I, I lose my breath and I'm like, <sighs> I can like, <laughs> as I finish, I'm like. Yeah. <sighs> I anyway. find that so much when I'm like sending you a voice note about like an idea I'm really excited about. And then I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and then towards the end, I'm almost out of breath. Well, <laughs> that's it. I mean, I think we're about to get into this in a second with the emph- emphasis techniques, but like there is time and a place to be fast in my head. Mm. If I speak fast, there's usually, or at least 
if I reflect upon it, I usually think it's because I'm so excited about what I'm trying to say. If that makes sense, I'm, I, I care enough. So if anything, it's a good way to show that you're excited about what you're saying. Yeah. Then if you, uh, then if you speak really slowly, but the difference is, I guess, when you speak slowly, you have that air of like power and like you're in control. Whereas somebody like me who just speaks like rapid as quick as I can, is almost like a little puppy getting excited to see like a like a bone, you know? Yeah. It, it, it that's like the feeling you kind of get from it. But anyway, so emphasis techniques. Certain points carry more weight in your message. So modulating your pace, utilizing pauses and adjusting intonation can highlight these crucial moments. So for example, start at a regular speed. Oh God, wait, I'm actually gonna do this one. Okay, right. This fall in sales was predicted. The industry body released a statement saying, minor pause speed up. We're very disappointed with what has been allowed to happen. But sadly, this is the only possible outcome once the regulations were brought in. It goes on back to regular speed. We'll be taking legal action. Minor pause. And look at the numbers it released. Sales in the sector were 100 million two years ago. Last year, they were 10 million. <laughs> How did I do, mate? <laughs> Beautiful. Mate, I was, I was, I was I think, in the whole time. I think I need practice. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, that's, it's funny, like, trying to do that naturally, even though you're reading the actual, like, you know, direction. It, in your, it's so funny, because in your head, when I read that, right, when he's like, use this as an example. When I read it in the book, I was like, oh, it's a great example. When you say it out loud, when yeah. you do it, it just doesn't, I don't have the same, no. I don't think I have what he had in his mind. Yeah. Mate, well, you know, it's, it's tricky. To, I think it's pretty tricky to do that. Um, all right. So then on to script marking techniques. I mean, these are just basic things that you can see on the book summary, but essentially like, you know, a dash is a pause or two dashes is pause for emphasis. Um, a little arrow is keep talking or underline. I mean, these are all straightforward things, but essentially like mark your script if you're doing like you know if you're explaining something verbally and you've got like a, a speech or a presentation then yeah probably mark it so you can know you where to put the emphasis on um certain words and stuff and then sticking to time so there are two common pitfalls when it comes to sticking to time one is you tend to be slow when performing compared to rehearsing in a relaxed environment although i find that quite interesting because i would think that if you're a bit unconfident or you're a bit nervous you probably speed up but yeah i guess maybe this is under the condition that you're confident um and then number two is the tendency to add extra words and phrases during the speech which can make it sound fluent um but it also extends the time and reduces precision so it's just remaining aware of that and i wonder then... if the slower the slowness is because you almost you you have a tendency to like overcompensate maybe at the main event. I yeah, don't know. Well, I have no idea. I don't maybe know. Maybe you just yourself and you just, I don't know, in the first <laughs> like two minutes panicking. and Yeah. You know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, all right, so then have a hands plan. I think <laughs> I could. Keep them out of their pants. I, well. I can resonate to this one. Well, yeah. <clears throat> just stick them in your pockets. <laughs> Um, when it comes to hands, less is often more. Excessive hand movements. Who am I right now? Uh, Peterson, right? Yeah, there we go. Um, excessive hand movements can be distracting. However, <laughs> subtle gestures can serve as effective punctuation. I quite liked that. Like the I just the phrase, the idea of you know using hands as punctuation. Yeah, um, I'll be, I, I've seen some people do like small, big, or some like you know what I mean. It kind of it does reiterate the point. Yeah, absolutely. And next we've got, you know, the one that everybody's asking themselves is how to stand in case you didn't know already. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Stand comfortably, <laughs> imagining the camera or audience as a person. Let your body and hands settle naturally, fostering a more engaging and natural delivery. Plan your movements in your speaking space. You'll so soon work out the places where you feel comfortable speaking from and where you don't. Avoid awkward no man's land scenarios. The key is to decide and to be clear on your plan for effective delivery. It kind of makes me wonder when you see like comedians, you know, like pacing and stuff. Do they, mm. you know, they probably planned that out, you'd assume. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just do what feels most natural to them as they, as they explain. You know, I guess it depends how long they If you make it too robotic and too planned, it almost comes across as inauthentic, you know? Mm. Yes, I, I, think, I think it's just a skill that you learn to do. And over time, you probably feel quite comfortable and you have like, not like routines that you do, but like certain movements that you're just comfortable with. Whereas like, I think if you're starting out or you're, you're doing a presentation that you've never done before, maybe you're kind of a bit like, okay, well, where the fuck should I walk? Um, yeah. 
So the importance of rehearsal. Here's a rehearsal checklist, another, another, another checklist. So go through each section individually, rehearse the entire explanation, address any parts you weren't satisfied with, ensure you stay comfortably within your time limit, Sim, uh, simulate the speaking environment, considering movements and positions, and lastly, consider recording for valuable feedback. Optional, but recommended for important explanations. And I think that is actually something that I would recommend quite a lot is try and get, you know, feedback. Um, and if even, if, even if it's your own feedback. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so quick check. Is there any aspect of the explanation and how you're going to deliver it that you're still not sure of? And have you rehearsed what you're aiming to do? 